Hey there, my name is Jeff Fritz. Welcome back to the show. Today is May 9th, 2018, and my guest today is... Aditi Dugar. Hey Aditi, thanks so much for joining me. Now, here at Build 2018, I understand that we had a couple of announcements about AI and machine learning in .NET. Yeah, Can you sure. talk a little bit about them? Yeah, for sure. So here at Build, we announced the launch of ML.NET. And ML.NET is an open source, cross-platform, machine learning framework for .NET developers. And it's made with .NET as well. Okay. So as a, as a .NET developer that normally spends my days writing websites, connecting to databases, I can actually program and do some machine learning, some, some of that big data stuff that I've seen people talk about? Exactly. Okay. Uh, so we've tried to make it easy for .NET developers to get started okay. um, in, in a language that they understand and know. All right. So I, I'm sure you've got some samples here. Yes. All right. Well, can we take a look at some samples and, and, you know, let me see how easy it is for, for a normal web developer, ASP.NET programmer like myself. Can yeah. get started with ML.NET. Yeah, for sure. Uh, right. So today we're actually going to show you a sample where we have some broken music. And we're going to use ML.NET to train and build a model to be able to predict how to fix the music. Now, I'm assuming that the model you're talking about isn't like the models that I'm used to in ASP.NET MVC that I use with Entity Framework. This has got to be something different, right? Yeah, this is a machine learning model. Okay. And a machine learning model basically has all of your input parameters and features necessary to be able to predict your output. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, well, let's take a look at your sample and maybe I'll learn a little bit more here. Sounds good. All right, let's go over to our code. So, uh, if we take a look at this app here, you can see that there's some music, but there's clearly some weird stuff going on here. Yeah, what's with these bars that are broken and, and listed below there? Yeah, so what we've done here is we've actually taken out some of the notes from this melody. So when I play it, you can see that it doesn't sound super great. Oh. Yeah, and it, it, it almost sounds like a phone's ringing there a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the app I'm going to build today and the model I'm going to build is going to help us fill in what these missing notes should be. And release that, replace that phone ringing sound. Exactly. Yeah. Something that actually sounds much better than what it does right now. Okay, let's <laughs> give it a shot. Awesome. So let's close out of this. So the first thing I'm going to show you here is just how that music is represented in this JSON file here. Um, mm, okay. So this is that exact same melody that we were looking at. You can see that each note here is represented by a number. And okay. Where I'm, we, sorry, go I'm ahead. used to seeing notes that are like A and B and yeah, exactly. F, right? Um, so each of those actually has a number that's associated with as well. Um, uh, okay. And in MIDI files, you can use that number to be able to play the note through this type of software. Okay, I get it. And where we've put the note equal to zero is where you actually saw those strange looking bars. Oh, okay. Those are the notes that we're going to end up fixing. Exactly. We're going to replace them with uh, different numbers that actually make sense in the context of all the other ones. Okay. Awesome. Um, so let's go over to my data. Um, so when you're first building a machine learning model, the first thing you're going to do is think about what kind of data you have to train your model. Mm. So this is the data that I started with. And what I have here is a bunch of different songs and all of the pitches and durations of all the pitches within each song. And that's kind of highlighted here. But this isn't really what I wanted to start with for building my model because um, I can't actually get to the prediction I want. So I had to do a bunch of pre-processing. Yeah, th this looks different from the JSON that you were just showing me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so what I actually transformed it into is this table here. And what this table does is it allows you to say, hey, there's one note in the measure that I want to predict, um, which is this column here, and also highlighted by this pink note here in this um, representation below. Okay. And since one measure is kind of a uh, set quantity in music that you can have a, a set number of notes that sound good together within a measure, I can use the other different notes within the measure to be able to predict what this note is. Mm. Um, okay. So that is all the, the rest of the things in the different columns that are represented by those same numbers that we were looking at in that JSON file. Okay, I can follow that. Yeah, and the other thing I'll mention here is um, for the purposes of machine learning, the note that we're predicting is called a label. Um, and then the rest of the things that we're using to predict them are called features. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to inspect our features to predict a label. Exactly. Okay. 
Great. Uh, so let's get started on building the model. So if I head over back to Visual Studio here into my application, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can see that I've created a template for building this model here called Music Notes Prediction. And I'm going to add a few things in here. So let's go through it step by step. Okay, now this this looks to me like a console application. It is. It, yeah. Is this .NET Framework or is it .NET Core? This is a .NET Core console app. Um, okay. And you can use any sort of console app to build your uh, model. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do here is to point to my data. So I'm going to create a few data paths that actually point to three different things. The first one is a data path that points to my train file, and that's the data that I'm using to actually train my model. Okay, so it's a, a CSV, it's a comma-separated value mm -hmm. uh, file, looks like a spreadsheet sometimes. Okay. Exactly. Um, the second thing is a test, uh, test data path, and this holds my test data. And that's what I'm going to use to make sure that my model is actually working and test mm. it and evaluate what the accuracy is. You're writing unit tests as you go here? Yes. Oh, man. Good practices, <laughs> too. All right, let's go. <laughs> and then the last thing is a model path to be able to save a zip file with my model so I can go and consume it from my other application. Sure. That makes sense. And then my main function here just has three different steps. The first is to train the model. The second is to predict, uh, which is that unit test. Mm -hmm. And the third is to evaluate and make sure if it's somewhat accurate. OK. So first, we're going to go ahead and look at this train code. And the first concept here I want to introduce is a learning pipeline. So the first step in building our ML.NET model will be to create a new learning pipeline. And your pipeline is basically something that you can load your data into, transform your data, and train your data with. Okay, so in learning pipeline, that's that's provided by the ML.NET framework. Exactly. As well as the uh, prediction model mm -hmm. generic object you're outputting. Right. Okay. The second thing I'm going to do is load my data. So this is referencing that data path that I um, created above here. Sure, the CSV on disk. Exactly. Right. And you're telling it there's headers in that file and separated by commas. Comma. Mm -hmm. Sure. The next step will be to add a label encoder. So because in my data set, um, if you remember, I was actually referencing a note name like that G, A, B, like you were talking about before. But our learning algorithm can actually only handle numbers. So what we need to do is assign a numeric value to it so that the learning algorithm can process it. OK. So we're saying that the notes are the labels that we're going to be predicting. Yes, exactly. Got it. The next step is to concatenate all of my features, which were those other notes that we're using to predict it, into one um, feature vector. And so this is, again, putting it into a numeric feature vector so that it can be handled by the learning algorithm. Mm, OK. So those are all the different notes throughout the, the song. Yeah, these are all actually all the different columns in that CSV file. So um, these are all the different potential notes that could be input and used to train the model. OK. The next step would be to add a learner. So there's lots of different types of learners that you can use with machine learning. And uh, this is really dependent on your scenario. So this scenario in particular is a classification scenario. And what I mean by that is that we have distinct buckets. In this case, there are 12 different notes that we want to end up predicting. And so each of those is a class that you're going to try and predict out of this model. Um, so this uh, learning algorithm here is really something that is used for multi-classification. Um, mm. But this is also where your experimentation comes in. So there's a few different algorithms that you can use for multi-classification. And if this wasn't super accurate, maybe I could go and choose a different learning algorithm and see if it's better or worse. OK, I can follow that. But how, do you, how did you decide that this was the algorithm to start with? Um, it, it's really um, anything you want to start with. I mean, I, I think oh. there's, a, I definitely need to pick something that was relevant to a multi-classification scenario. So okay. um, as a, a different example, you could have a regression scenario, which could be something like predicting house prices or stock prices, okay. and where you're predicting a continuous value on a scale. Um, but 
here, because I have distinct classification buckets, I needed to pick something that was relevant for that. All right. Um, but I just picked one of the options and said, does this work? Um, and, and we'll give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. All right. The next step I'm going to do is to convert that note number back into the name that it was originally. Since we converted it to a number, we actually want to output that GAB again. So we'll convert it back here. And then next, I'm going to train the model. So I've called pipeline.train here. Mm -hmm. And this takes in my input, which is this music note class, and output, which is the music notes prediction. So let me actually just show you that really quickly. If I go to musicnotes.cs, uh, you can see that I've defined two different classes here. One represent, represents that input, which is again those columns that I showed you in that CSV file. And then the output is that predicted label here, okay. which is the note column. So if we go back into my main file, um, that's actually everything to build the entire pipeline and mm. train the model. And up until this point, when I actually execute my code, nothing happens until I say pipeline.train. So I've just set up the pipeline in a specific order, and then as soon as I say pipeline.train, that's when everything executes. Okay, and then so now it's sitting in memory in this model mm -hmm. object that you have here on line 62. Right. All right. And then the last step I want to do is to write it to a zip file so I can actually go back into that other app I had opened before and consume it. So model training can sometimes take a long time. You want to be able to persist it and, and take that learning and reuse it in other, other applications. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to retrain your model every single time you're rebuilding your application. Okay. You probably train it once and then consume it from your application. And if you want to go back and retrain, it's in a nice separate area that you can say, I'm going to make all these experimentation values and uh, try different things and mm. see if I can go and plug that back into my app. The okay. other thing is it enables different endpoints. So you could have a few different endpoints um, to put in to call this model from mm. if you want a different endpoint. Sure. So that's it for my train code. Um, what I've done is create the pipeline, load my data, transform the data, train it, and save it to a zip file. That kind of makes sense. So let's go on to my prediction. Um, and this is the unit test. Yeah, this is the test. All right. So the first thing I will do is create a test measure. So that's in the same data format mm, yeah. um, as we were showing before with the ones and zeros representing what notes are there and what's no what notes are missing. Mm. And then I'm going to actually make the prediction by calling model.predict and input that test measure into here. And that's it for my prediction. Okay. And that's gonna output Gosh. on the console what for this measure the prediction should be. Okay. Now how do we know if that's right or not? So this is a, a test measure that I've chosen uh, okay. to put in here as something that I know. What you have an expected I have an note. expected answer to it. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is in music, uh, it's pretty forgiving. So oh, yeah. there's lots of different combinations of notes that are going to sound good together. Um, so Right is, is kind of a flexible word in music. Sure, yeah. sure. My mother would tell you that I wasn't, it wasn't very forgiving for me, and I wasn't made for, I didn't have the talent for music. <laughs> so let's see, what, let's see what we can figure out here. The last uh, method I'm going to write is this evaluate method, and this is going to allow us to say, is our model even accurate? Okay. So I'm going to load that test data in, similarly to how I loaded the train data before. Then I'm going to choose an evaluator. The evaluator, again, is dependent on the scenario that you're looking for. So this is a classification evaluator, and there's a regression evaluator for regression scenarios mm. and so on. Okay. The next thing I'll do is actually evaluate the model. So I call evaluator.evaluate, input that model, and the test data. Okay, so we have a similar evaluator to how we built and trained the model mm -hmm. so that we can look at the two and say, well, did we get something that looks like what we were expecting? Yep. All right. And then I'm going to output the accuracy. Um, and accuracy is one measurement that you can use to say, is my model good or is it 
do I need to make some tweaks to make it even better? Okay, sure. Of course I want to make sure that my model is accurate. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's, that's all the code we have to write. Okay. So let's go ahead and start this up, and we're going to start without debugging here. All right, let's see what we got. All right, so let's zoom in a little. All right, so two threads to train. Okay, choosing a maximum frequency of two, maximum iterations. I, I don't know what some of those things, but using best model from iteration 100. So it went through almost 400 iterations, mm -hmm. and it found the 100th, not training a calibrator. But it says note is A. Is that the note it should have picked up? That's one of the, the good notes that I should have picked up. Okay. Now, if we ran it again, would we always get A, or would we get it picking something else? So in this case, it's actually just uh, the, the way the algorithm actually works is it's going to say, here's what I have with what I'm going to guess with most confidence. And then it's actually going to tell you what you could guess with second most confidence and third most confidence. So what you're going to see here is the first most confidence because okay. that's all I printed on the line. Sure. Um, and that's always going to be A every single time I train it with the case that I presented. Okay. Unless I change my training data. Okay. Now it's saying the accuracy is about 34. Is that like 34% accurate? Yeah. So accuracy, this is micro accuracy in specific, and it can be, it's on a zero to one scale. Okay. And the closer you are to one, the better. Um, so okay. 0.34 is probably not Great not accuracy. Perfect, not great, but it's it's good for what we're trying to do. Yeah, because you said music is forgiving. Music is forgiving. Okay, and there's some ways that you could improve it as well. Um, one is to provide more context. So I could have said, "Here's all the notes in the measure before it. Here's all the notes in the measure after it," mm -hmm. and that may actually improve the accuracy of the model just by giving it more context. Okay, and then more data is always extremely helpful. Sure, lots and lots of data. Yeah. All right. Um, but in this case, since music is forgiving, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. So now that I've trained my model and saved it to that zip file, let me go and grab that. So if I right click here and say open file in folder and dig into my bin folder here, oh. you can see I have that music model. Yep. There it zip is. File. So I'm going to copy this and head back to my other application. And now I'm going to go into my Solution Explorer and paste it here. I think you want to know the project, oh, not the yes. solution. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You can see it showed up here in the Solution Explorer. Okay. And now I can consume it from this app. So let's head into my music repair. Okay. Um, and that's going to help me call that model mm. and actually consume it. So the first thing I'm going to do is load the model in here. So I'll put that right here. And all I said was load model. Sure. I'm guessing load model is a method somewhere else that has all the things necessary to grab that zip file and open it up for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, I'm going to create that feature. So this is creating that measure every single time for the song that I'm trying to predict with and putting it in that same data format as I showed you before. Okay. Now I'm actually going to make the prediction for each of those measures. Mm. And call model.predict and input that feature. Okay. Now build, I'm assuming these two, right, doing that prediction since it has the model, that should be very quick. It is. Okay, good. Because that would be, if it's slow while you're trying to play music, that's going to be a terrible thing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And the last thing I'm going to do is convert that note name back to a number. Uh, so it knows how to play it, because you were saying earlier that the MIDI knows numbers. It doesn't know... No, the note name okay. in specific. Yep. Um, and that's that's it. All right. So... so so show me that it's a better musician than me. <laughs> so let me rebuild my model. Uh, rebuild the application. Yes, rebuild gotcha. the solution. Sorry, not the model. Rebuild the solution, and then I will start without debugging here. And now I'm 
that's come up. We click on music and it's going to load in that same melody, but hopefully you're not going to see any gaps in here. We won't see that phone ringing or hear the phone. Yes, we don't want to see that. Okay, that looks a little bit different from what we saw earlier. I see a couple of red notes in here too. Yeah, the red ones are the ones that we actually filled in. Okay. So those All are right. the things that we've predicted into here. So let's give it a shot. Is it better? Yeah. Okay, significantly better. It's not. It's we don't have. We lost the phone ringing, and and it definitely it definitely goes. It does. Okay, cool. So with a little help from ML.net, we trained a model. We used that model back in our application to teach it to use and and use music and and fill in the gaps here. That's pretty neat. It is pretty neat. All right. And yeah, this may not be something that you're going to use in your everyday job, perhaps. No. But but, that but they're easy. in in a situation where where I might have some corrupted music, you know, if we really trained this out and we had a lot of data to go after it, and I and I had a corrupted sound file or something, this could help do a repair in the future. Definitely. This technique, mm -hmm. very cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I I appreciate learning it. Now, do we have other samples that we could show? We do. Um, so I'm actually going to bring in Rowan, uh, my okay. colleague, and he's going to talk about how to do sentiment analysis. Yes. Oh my gosh, sentiment is a huge thing for me. All right. Awesome. So cool. Bring on Rowan. Hey there, Rowan. Hey, Good man. to see you. Good to see you again. So what are we going to do about sentiment analysis and artificial intelligence machine learning? So we've looked at ML.net. We thought we'd kind of just keep going with our demo and pull in some other artificial intelligence uh, features that are okay. available in .NET, other products as well. We went through blog posts and we scraped some feedback that's been given to the .NET team over time. Oh, so man. So we've loaded them up here. We'll start with a good oh, one. Oh, okay. So in response to our ML.NET announcement blog post, Mike Triple E said, Woohoo, this is excellent news. Best news of build thus far. Pretty, you know, pretty positive. That's, yeah, I like seeing that. That's the feedback. Now, when we look at the screen at the moment, obviously, we'd have to read through all this, work out what the sentiment is. We would like a nice way to be able to visualize that. So I have a bar down the bottom set up the sentiment, but at the moment it's blank. Yeah, I, I want to be able to look at my blog post and I want to know, you know, how much do I really need to triage these comments? If folks are upset at me, uh, I'm going to have to get in there and start answering the hard questions. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So we're going to use uh, Azure Cognitive Services, which ML.net we looked at is a custom model where I provide the data and I train it. Sure. And then I do predictions that's very specific to what I'm trying to do. Azure Cognitive Services provides me a whole bunch of pre-trained, out-of-the-box solutions. Oh, so so with the DD, we trained it how to read music, but we've already we've already got some stuff in Azure that knows how to read English in this case. Yeah, so detecting the sentiment in a piece of text is a fairly general uh, problem that needs to be solved, and so a central solution that I can just use out of the box makes sense there. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Obviously, there aren't too many people that have trained artificial intelligence algorithms to predict music. There's not one of those I can just use, so... <laughs> no, no. But maybe now there will be. Okay. Swapping back to Visual Studio, the feedback is loaded up inside this feedback service, and I have a placeholder here to implement sentiment detection. Okay. Now, with Cognitive Services, there are some nice .NET APIs I can add. So mm. I've added the Text Analytics API NuGet package. Okay. From Cognitive Services. And they also, well, I guess within that NuGet package, there is this text analytics API object that I can create. I tell it what region my text analytics subscription is in. I give it the key. This is like my authentication to it. Sure. Notice good coding practice. So I haven't put my key in text. So. No, no. It's in your secrets. Good. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. All right. So the first thing we need to do is construct the input that we're going to send off the text analytics API. Now, I'm using link, which can sometimes be a little bit nice and concise and terse, but not always the easiest to understand. What I'm basically doing here is looping through the data and selecting out multiple instances of this language input. So okay. for each piece of sentiment, we're going to create a batch that has one of these objects for every line of text, and then we're going to send that off as one batch. So I'm guessing the EN that you have there, that's you're telling it that it's English. Yeah, so the Text Analytics API can handle other languages as well, but in our case, the feedback is all in English. Okay. 
but that's pretty cool that it'll pick up the other languages. Yeah, and it will tell you more than sentiment too. We're going to focus in on sentiment, but it can pick up the keywords and other things like that. Oh, all right, all right. Now we send that off to the sentiment async API. So, mm -hmm. of course, everything's async, so we don't block our UI thread while it runs. We pass in that batch that we just created. Okay. And we get a result back. And, of course, the result is just a strongly typed .NET object that we can loop through. Okay. That's exactly what we're going to do. On the end here, we're going to loop through. The result has a documents. The document is just one of the things that I inputted. So, in our case, each piece of feedback is a, a document. Okay. So each one of those comments is a document. Exactly. Got it. And now is, is the score, is that similar to what we saw with the Diddy where it's a zero to one? Yep. All right. One being positive, zero being negative, 50% being neutral on mm. that scale then. Come on, lots of ones, lots of ones. We'll see, we might have selected a good range. So, uh, yeah. so we're going to update our object model that we started with and we're going to set the score to the score that came back from the text analytics. Okay, model. and that'll fill in that bar. I'm guessing right that bar you're mapping to your score value. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, fire up now. Obviously, reading values on the screen is useful, but it would be good for us to be able to easily and quickly visualize. So I've also added some coloring in as well. Yeah. So I'll load up. I will see that. Oh, look at this now. All right. So we can see this very positive piece of feedback we got from Mike Triple E. 97%. All yeah, right. Actually, Home run. Green on that. The next one along is kind of a neutral. Someone was just pointing out a uh, spelling mistake in one of our blog posts. Well, that's not really positive or negative. It's kind of in the middle. So that came back as neutral. Decided to color code that as blue. Okay. And then, to be uh, fair, we also pulled in some uh, negative feedback as well. All right. So Dave wasn't super happy about some of the things we said in the blog post. And uh, I think probably the piece that I picked up on here was that our team needs to find something productive to do. And that we're a stain on computer science. Oh. Which, yeah, fairly harsh. Yeah. So fifteen. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we'll work on that. Yeah, we will. Now, compared to the music demo, this seemed pretty boring at this stage. Yeah. So we thought we'd try and spice this up a little bit. So, okay. Uh, I have an Arduino controller here with me. Oh. In front of the camera there. Oh, look at that. Yeah, there we yeah. go. So Arduino just hooked up the USB port. On top of it, I have an add-on, which is called a shield in Arduino speak. It's a DMX shield. So DMX is just a protocol that's used for stage lighting, things like that. So if you go to a conference and there's lights that change color on the stage, that would be DMX, the protocol. And it's, okay. And then I have a little, some other hardware on there with us here. Um, it's hooked up to some lighting. So as we experimented around a bit, trying to get lights to work with a camera. Yeah. <laughs> lights work oh, yeah. great in front of an audience, but on a camera, getting the colors to show is not that great. So here is the very elegant solution we came up with. Very elegant. We put the lights in a box, and we put a piece of paper over the top. <laughs> okay. So, can you hold that for me, Jeff, so it shows up on the camera? I'm going to flick the on button here, and we'll see that when we're on a negative comment, we get a red light in the box. When we go to something more positive, we go green, and then when we get our neutral comments, we get a nice blue color from the box. All right, that's pretty cool. Yeah, this seemed like a bit of fun feedback to add on. Oh, yeah. Um, in terms of talking to the Arduino controller, uh, we do that over a COM port. Uh, so we just have some simple code in our app there. But I could definitely see, you know, when you when you come in in the morning after a blog post has been published, to have a have a light kind of in the corner of the team room that says the sentiment on on our last announcement is this shade. It's it's green. Everybody's happy with it. But if it's red, well, you know what, team, we better go and let's uh, take a look and see if we can fix this. Yeah, and I think this kind of show all this stuff was. It's been pretty easy to build most of it. Um, so I think it just kind of shows how flexible, like we can be doing sentiment analysis off with APIs, we can be training custom models, we can be sending commands through to an Arduino controller to set lights to different colors. There's just a whole bunch of stuff we can do. Oh my gosh, yes. And using using an Azure service like that as the comments are coming in, you could be automatically scoring those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, really neat stuff. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to hand off and, and there's keep, more. We we'll keep going with some other stuff. Okay, so I'm going to ask Bree to come up and cool. Let's take a look. Part. Thanks so much, Rowan. All right, Hi. how you doing there, Bree? Good, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. So now, what we did all this with sentiment. Now, what do you right. want to show us? Right. So another really cool part of cognitive services is called Face API. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. I've been told I've got a face for radio. So all right, let's see what we got here. Um, so what it does is it uses image processing to analyze or detect and analyze faces and photos. Okay. Um, and actually, I think I have a slide here that I can show as an example. 
Um, so here it's detecting three faces in the photo, um, and it will return back a unique face ID for each face that is uh, identified, and then it will return back facial attributes such as uh, predicted gender, predicted age, if they're wearing glasses or not, uh, and as you see in this demo, emotion. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and it's and it's in this nice JSON format we see on the right side. Um, it actually used to be like that. Um, they actually just changed it so uh, there's a wrapper around it, and it actually sends back as something a lot easier uh, that you don't have to parse to the JSON. Oh, terrific! <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, with the emotions, the way that it returns it is as scores. So you can see that there's anger, contempt, disgust, all the way down to surprise, mm. and uh, each of them has a confidence score uh, between zero and one. One being the most confident. Uh, as you're being the least confident that that face is displaying that emotion. So I can continue to reuse that score knowledge that I've had, whether it was our own model we trained or the sentiment analysis, and now with this. Okay. Right. So that's how it looks like there. Um, let me go back to our code here. So right now we don't have it implemented, and I'll just show you kind of, it just takes a second to load what it looks like with right, it, so without that's it being the camera on your laptop yep, you're looking at. Just webcam, yep. So you can see, analysis is not implemented. Okay. All right, so let's go over to the code. And it's very similar to the text analytics where you just create that instance, but instead of uh, text analytics API, face API, um, it's using, again, the Azure Cognitive Services uh, vision and face API. So. so we're gonna send a picture off to Azure to look at, analyze, and come back. Right, exactly. All right. So, um, we're doing it via file stream. It's just a local image just captured from the webcam. And we'll get rid of that. And we are here. Uh, so actually, let me go back here. So we create a list here. Um, and we only want the emotions to be sent back, because like you saw before, a lot of different face attributes can mm. be sent. Uh, so we just want this list here of emotions. Uh, so then uh, you do that API call with the file stream and the attributes that we want returned. And if a result or if a face is found, it'll get the first face that it detects, only return back the emotion. And as I said before, it will, will return all the emotions and the, their scores. But we just wrote a, uh, a method to only get the emotion the with the highest score. One. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, the happiest one. Or the one, it'll be the emotion that has the highest confidence scores. Oh, right. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So let's run this again. So now when I take a photo, it should come back with my emotion. Gotcha. And we'll give it a second. So you can see this one saw that I was happy, had a big smile. Mm -hmm. We'll try out a few more. We've got some sad. And we'll try, we'll try one more. That's always my favorite to see what it detects. <laughs> so I'll put them up on the big screen here so you can see. So it detected happiness, some sadness, some neutral, some anger. Um, so yeah, so it's really cool. It'll just, it, Takes, it does pretty well with the emotions, I think. Uh, yeah, see. <laughs> certainly does. Um, and since we had the music playing before, we decided to have a little bit of fun with this and actually put this along with music, so each emotion will change the music a bit. Oh, listen to that. All right. All right. Um, and we also decided, um, since you're able to use a local image file, but also you can use an image URL mm. uh, with the face API, we decided to copy this over and use Twitter as well. Uh -oh. <laughs> and uh, so we had Better a hashtag. Twitter than Reddit. Yes. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, we had a hashtag that we used and uh, went through and searched for this specific hashtag. It was, uh, I don't think it's actually displayed here. Uh, MS, there was a .NET, MLNet demo or something like that. Okay. And it pulled those through and you can see for each one that it took our <laughs> our emotions here from when we had some people in the audience do it as well um, and so we put that along with music as well and so that'll cycle through and that does controls the percussion oh neat so then right. we bring the music back around and then 
bring the feedback with the lights. Easy, we have a music and light show. <laughs> Controlled by uh, machine learning and sentiment analysis and Very neat. Uh, emotion analysis. So. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So, so I learned a lot today from you all about uh, sentiment analysis, doing some vision inspection there to do the face API detection. That's pretty neat, right? I can think of all kinds of ways that I could, I could look at my photo album and find all the pictures of my teenage daughters being upset at me. Right? That's gonna. What kind of music be, would that play? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to think about that. But that, that is very cool. All right. So thanks so much, Bree, for joining me, yep. uh, and Rowan and Aditi. This was really neat. I learned a lot here. You know, I, I can't wait to try ML.net. Now we have a, a link that we put up at the top of the video here. If you check that up, check that out up in the top right corner. Dot, dot net slash ML, and that's where we can learn more about this, yeah. right? Yeah, and there's a, an easy way to get started on there as well. Um, that takes like less than ten minutes to get up and running with uh, machine learning dot net. Oh, that's great. All right. So check it out. Download that today. Let us know what you think. We'll see you next time.